new day, but we're going to continue reading Aloha Summer. We are in chapter 12. All right. <clears throat> now I've been around enough fishermen to know that slight exaggerations sometimes occur. When one fisherman's talking to another, well, there's some kind of unseen force that pushes the hands just a little bit farther apart each time he shows someone how big his fish was. Gravity seems to increase. Two, at least by a pound or so, each time the story is told. And the one that got away, they're always the world's record. Daddy told me, it ain't lying, it's just fishing. But 186 pounds, no way. Came real close to blowing the whole thing that first morning. If Carol hadn't reached around me, taken the reins and kicked Ginger to get her going, well, I guess we would have still been sitting there by the time school was over. As it was, I slipped through the door just as Mr. Foster came out on the steps to ring the bell. True to her word, Carol came in about five minutes later so that no one would know we had ridden together. I felt kind of guilty about it because Mr. Foster scolded and fussed at her for a good ten minutes on account of being late to class. She never once said it was my fault for wanting to sit on the hill and argue with her about the size of a fish. Fact was, she never so much as looked in my direction the whole time Mr. Foster was chewing on her. Mama had fried chicken and green beans for lunch. I gobbled it down and got back to school as quick as I could. When I asked Ted Jacobs what an ah he was, he just looked at me. So figuring he didn't know the Hawaiian name, I simply asked him how big the fish were around here. Ted's nose kind of crinkled up. He rubbed the fingertips and he rubbed the fingertips and thumbs of both hands together, then flopped his hands back and forth like he was trying to get something nasty off of them. I don't like fish, he whined. They stink. It was the most talking Ted had done since I'd been here, and it was all I could do to keep my eyes from rolling clean up into the top of my skull. Robert and a Japanese boy named Shintaro were over with the other boys, choosing up sides for a baseball game. As always, when I walked up, everybody left. Pretending they were doing something else, talking, starting a different game, whatever, it was all the same. This time, I didn't let it bother me. Robert, I called when he started away from me. Do you know what an ahi is? He smiled politely. It's a fish. What you call a tuna. They big? I guess, he shrugged. How big? Shintaro stepped up beside him. I have not to catch one, but see them in boats one time. They may be long as Shin, he pointed to himself. Way more, maybe much as Shin's papa. My mouth flopped open and I felt a rush of cool air fill my lungs. Maybe Carol wasn't lying. Maybe. Before I could say anything else, both boys turned and slipped away. Somehow, some way, Carol did just like she said she would. She wasn't a girl when she was with me. On the rides to and from school, we talked about fishing and hunting and stuff like that. I told her about shooting quail with my grandpa's shotgun or hunting rabbits with a twenty two rifle. Carol said that she had never been hunting, but the boys hunted pig. They used spears just like they did when hunting Honu. She had speared Honu before. I found out that a Honu was a green sea turtle, but even after listening to Carol's description and stories, I still couldn't imagine how or why anyone would have to use a spear to catch a dumb, slow old turtle. She promised to show me someday. Every morning when Ginger and I picked Carol up for the ride to school, Mr. Pukui would ask me in to eat some poi or sit and rest. Carol explained that it was a custom to invite people to eat and drink. She said that even a stranger should not pass somebody's house without being invited, and she hinted that it would be impolite for me to keep refusing. She also explained that her name was Kalola. At school, Mr. Foster made her use her American name, but her real name, her Hawaiian name, was Kalola. Friday after school, instead of taking her straight home, we rode the opposite direction. We kept the ridge of the mountain to our right. She wouldn't tell me where we were going, but it was a good ride. We kept Ginger at a fast trot. As we rode, I couldn't help but notice the trees. Carol, I mean Kalola, she told me they were Norfolk Pines. Mr. Monroe and his wife had lived on Lanai since they were first married. For many years, he had carried the pine seeds in, pine seeds in his sandal, saddlebags and planted the trees. It was a long ride, but we finally stopped at the weirdest place I ever saw in my life. It was kind of a field on the top of a hill, only instead of a field of pineapple or little pine saplings, or even a field of cactus and shrub and scrub mesquite trees, this field was full of rock. There were boulders all over the place, huge boulders, small ones, just scattered around in the red rocky dirt. Even coming from Oklahoma, I'd seen boulders before. About a two-hour drive from our farm was a place called the Wichita Mountains. Back when Grandpa and Betty were both alive, we'd take the Model T and drive down once or twice a year. 
There were boulders all over the Wichita's. Besides, my parents and I had taken the train through the Rockies to get to San Francisco. There were big boulders in the Rocky Mountains. The thing about the Wichita's and the Rockies, well, the boulders were always down near the bottom of a mountain, cluttered or clumped around where they'd fallen and rolled down or something. Here, at this place, there was nowhere for them to roll down from. The rocks were on the very top with absolutely nothing else around. It is called the Garden of the Gods, she explained, when she, was, when she got down from Ginger. Where did all the big rocks come from, I asked, still looking around for a place he might have rolled down. Pele threw them. Who's Pele? I swung down from the saddle. Pele is the goddess of fire of the volcano. She once lived in Palawai, she pointed, the basin where Lanai City and the pineapple fields are. She now lives in Kileu, a Kilaue, on the big island. I frowned and followed her through the field of enormous boulders. You believe in gods and goddesses? She stopped and turned to face me. I couldn't help smiling back when she smiled. No, I believe in one God and in Jesus. But Makali still believes. I like to listen to his stories. He said Pele is a very angry goddess. In her anger, she made all the islands. All the islands? I frowned. You mean this one and the one where Honolulu is? No, all the islands. There's more than two? She turned to look at me. There are many, don't you know this? I shrugged and shook my head. Monday after school, we will ride to Lanahale. I will show you. We walked and looked around. Long black shadows crawled from the rocks. It was eerie, almost spooky, the way the place made me feel. All of a sudden, I noticed I was alone. I stopped dead in my tracks and looked around. Kalola was no place in sight. I called out to her a couple of times. When she didn't answer, I started hunting. Between the eerie surroundings and the quiet, it might near scare me to death when she jumped out from behind a big rock and yelled. I spun, glaring at her through tight eyes. She only laughed. You scared the devil out of me, I snarled. She laughed again. I doubled up my fist and punched her on the arm. Darned if she didn't slug me back. She had a right hook every bit as good as Charlie Eagle's. If I hadn't blocked it with my shoulder, it probably would have knocked the wind out of me. We scuffled around a while, then took turns playing hide and seek. We talked all the way home, and I could hardly wait for Monday. I'm going to go ahead and read chapter 13. The trees are called Norfolk Pines. Mr. Monroe planted most of them himself. He was the foreman of the Baldwin Cattle Ranch. The ranch was here before Mr. Dole bought Lanai. The cattle and sheep overgraze this island, so Mr. Monroe rides around and plants trees. There's other islands all around us. I seen them just this afternoon. Maui is the other side of the mountain. I talked fast. Like if I slowed down, I'd forget something or not have time to get it all in. And there's a little horseshoe island called Molokini, and lots of fish live in the middle of it. Then there's a flat island, only I can't remember the name, and Hawaii must be the huge, must be huge, because it's got mountains that are so high there's snow on them all the time. I stopped and sucked in a breath. Then I pointed out the back door. Over that way is Molokai. There's leopards there on one side of the island, so not many people go there. Only all around it is some of the best fishing in the whole entire world. Great big fish. Some are as big as ginger. Can you imagine a fish that big? And there's boats going back and forth to Maui all the time because folks here got relatives that live over there. Besides, it's only eight miles across the channel. Right here on this island, I had to stop and get him to catch my breath. I think it's lepers instead of leopards, Mama corrected when I stopped to breathe. Carmine mentioned something about a leper colony on Molokai. The people there have a bad disease, so they have to be isolated from other people. I was a bit disappointed that there weren't any leopards. One day I had hoped Carol and I could go and see one. Still, that didn't dampen my excitement. Well, anyway, I went right on. There's a place right here on Lanai called Garden of the Gods. I went there Friday. There's all these big rocks and stuff. Nothing else. No plants or grass or nothing. Just rocks. Tomorrow we're going to a place called Shipwreck Beach. It's on the far side of the island, so it might be dark before I get home. Then Wednesday, Mama was cooking fried taters and onions in the big black skillet. She stuck the scoop under the middle and turned them over. Where'd you get all this information about the other island, she asked. Daddy stood on the other side of her. And you keep saying we. Who's this we you keep talking about? He waited a second for the sizzling sound to stop. Then he snuck him a bite from the skillet. I was just reaching from the other side to swipe some taters and onions, too. Only when Mama asked who I was getting all my information from, and Daddy heard me say we instead of I, my hand froze in mid-reach. My mouth kind of fell open. Now you've done it, I thought. Now they're going to know you've been palling around with a girl. They're going to start in on that girlfriend bit. I blinked a couple of times and got my eyes shrunk back down so they weren't as big around as the skillet. Then I cleared my throat and took a deep breath. It's a friend. I cleared my throat again. 
a friend from school. I'm glad you finally got a friend, Daddy said, snitching another handful from Mama's skillet. You didn't say much, but I had the feeling you weren't too happy at school. Mama shot him a look for stealing food, but I guess she caught the movement from my hand in the skillet because she turned on me. Who is this friend? She squinted at the handful of taters. What's his name? What's he like? Lucky for me, I'd already popped my stolen taters and onions in my mouth. I always reach for the crispy brown clumps that were stuck together. There's nothing tastier than fried taters and onions right out of the skillet. The time it took to keep them from burning my tongue and to get them chewed, well, it gave me time to think. Name's Kalola, I answered. I felt real sly about remembering Carol's Hawaiian name. Mama and Daddy knew that Carol was a girl's name. They probably didn't have any idea about Kalola. Kalola, Mama repeated. Strange sort of name. Where's he from? Uh, uh, right here. Daddy peeked around her from the other side and kind of sneered at me. Everybody's from right here. He swiped from some, he swiped more taters and onions. I mean, where did he come from? Is he Filipino or Japanese or? Mama raised her wood turner, threatening him while her attention was on Daddy. I reached in and swiped me another brown clump. From Hawaii, from Lanai. Still munching his stolen goodies, Daddy leaned forward and propped his elbow on the edge of the stove. He rested his cheek against his fist. I thought most of the Hawaiians lived on the other side of the island, he frowned. They even have their own school over in a little place called Kiomuku. I didn't know there were any Hawaiians over on this side of Lanai. Oh, sure, I said. A sharp, crusty tater edge jabbed against the side of my throat when I swallowed. Remember that little girl who gave me the horse? She lives over here, remember? The puku eyes. Daddy f Daddy's frown grew deeper. I remember meeting the old man the day Paul Jacobs took me down there with him to see if he wanted to sell his place. Don't remember stopping at any other place on the side of the island. Thinking, remembering, this, his brow was really scrunched down now. Don't recall seeing any boy, though. Just that girl. They related. Uh, uh, yeah, I guess you could say that. Well, where's the house? It was Daddy's hungry as a mama who saved me. So far, I managed to answer all his questions without really lying to him. Now I was stuck. Only when Daddy reached for another handful of tater and onions, Mama had had enough. She whopped the back of his hand with her wood turner. Then, sure he was out of her skillet, she turned on me. That's enough, both of you. We'll not have any for supper if you two keep snitching all the food. Now both of you, scat. I scurried out on the front porch. That was a close call. I figured Daddy would sit down on the couch and listen to the radio until supper was ready. He didn't. He followed me out onto the porch. My teeth ground together inside my head. He was either going to make me tell him I've been spending my time with a girl, or he was going to make me lie to him. I didn't know which. You say that Mr. Monroe had been foreman of a cattle ranch? Yes, sir. I knew I was safe when he got that far off look in his eye. I'd seen the look before, usually when he was working on one of his inventions or tinkering with something. Whatever he was thinking about, it wasn't Kalola Pukuai. He looked up at the sky. Hmm. Ranch foreman. Cowboy. Hmm. <clears throat> Daddy didn't eat much supper. He kept staring off at the walls of the ceiling, thanking that faraway look in his eye. After dinner, Mama made him take his overalls off. Nobody came to Mama's table with their clothes off, even in the dead of August back home. We had to wear a shirt and everything, but she needed to get the zinc ointment on his legs and didn't want his overalls rubbing it off. Rubbing it off. Ever since he started working with the pineapples, once supper was over, Daddy sat around in his boxers. All at once, he sort of jerked. He gave a little blink and looked straight at me. You've been riding the horse every day, right? I cringed. Yes, sir. Here we go again. He's going to ask me about Kalola. Saddle and bridle out of Mr. Monroe's shed? Yes, sir. See any chaps hanging in there? I frowned, thinking, don't remember seeing any. Suddenly, Daddy was on his feet. He was a ranch foreman. Daddy smiled. I bet money he's got some chaps. Daddy took off for the back door. Mama hopped up and took off after him. Keith, Keith, for gosh sakes, put some pants on. <laughs> And that is the end of chapter 13.